from, uh, well, I'll kick things off. Uh, who would like to start? Uh, where or what would you like to discuss first? Any particular character? Um, I think the obvious character we should talk about is Jimmy. Um, he talks about himself in the third person throughout the whole show, which was kind of strange. And I think he also um, gets pretty angry at points throughout the show. Like he, at one second, he's pretty nice. And then something ticks him off, like Kramer, for example, ticked him off and then he exploded on him at the event. So yeah, he was pretty problematic. Very much so. And I think that we could identify that his behavior, at least the observed behavior, impairs functioning, uh, specifically uh, interpersonal functioning. So um, there's a couple, I think, uh, points to make here. And number one is the observation that he does tend to speak of himself in the third person, which um, most people don't do. I think at that point, the lower hanging fruit is to talk about narcissism and maybe in Jimmy's case, the narcissistic personality disorder. Uh, we had discussed before uh, pertaining to narcissism, but certainly other personality disorders, that while the DSM and the American Psychiatric Association uh, categorizes these illness in three groups or clusters, uh, cer certainly appreciating that groups or disorders within a group tend to cluster symptoms. For learning purposes, it's actually a little bit easier if you threw them all back into a proverbial hat and reorganize them into one of two groups or columns, one of which would be a group of personality disorders that adhere to a cardinal trait. Because while most of us have learned these personality disorders by memorizing um, the different signs and symptoms, that is the DSM criteria, if you understood that actual cardinal trait, those criteria simply morph into examples of that cardinal feature and they're much easier to learn and really don't require memorization. And for the narcissist, specifically narcissistic personality disorder, it's the individual who is arrogant and, uh, and believes they are special and truly believes that they could only be fully understood by somebody, somebody as special as they. And I think that's where uh, Jimmy comes in. And I think that is the root of why he refers to himself in the third person as he does, right? So uh, I think Jimmy allows us to remember that most of these personality disorders do have a cardinal trait. And he, he certainly appears to demonstrate that the cardinal trait of the narcissistic personality disorder. In addition to that, you identified that he seems, um, pretty unstable with regard to his affect, sometimes referred to as affective instability. He goes off very quickly. And that serves to remind us of the general definition of a personality. Um, many of you have taken personality theory and those of you who have probably understand that the textbook required for the course, if there is still such thing as a textbook, is the thickest. And if it's a PDF, it's going to be the longest. Every individual who had a theory got their own chapter. The fortunate thing for us in studying psychiatry is that the American Psychiatric Association has adopted the easiest and the shortest definition of a personality. And it covers four domains. Number one is the affective instability. And certainly Jimmy um, portrays that. Number two is interpersonal dysfunction. Number three is cognition. And number four is impulsivity. Right? Those are the four domains of a personality per the American Psychiatric Association, not necessarily tied to an individual personality disorder per se, but defining personality through those four domains, um, redefining or now defining a personality disorder is when an individual has deficits in two of those four domains. So not only does Jimmy, I think, portray behavior that is consistent with narcissism, but his affective instability reminds us of the broader definition, albeit a simple definition, that is four domains of personality. Again, cognition, impulsivity, interpersonal functioning, 
uh, as well as as well as affective instability or, or affect. Any questions with regard to narcissism and or personality disorders? Any other observations with regard to this character, Jimmy? I love the title of this particular episode too. I mean, it's a double layer that Larry David uh, titled it The Jimmy, which again would be something right out of the character's mouth. Um, not only referring to himself as Jimmy, but probably even putting the word, you know, the or the in front of it would be something that would be very comfortable to him. Any other characters you'd like to discuss this morning? About Jimmy, do you think he might have like a, like an anger issue problem? Do you think that could be kind of like thrown in there as well, just because of like his outbursts and just like his general actions? Yeah, so I, I think with regard to Jimmy's um, inappropriate modulation of anger, there's a couple things to consider. Um, one that always comes up and should is a condition called the intermittent explosive disorder, where individuals go off um, due to things, stimuli, uh, that are considered by a quote-unquote reasonable person to be out of context um, with, the, with the level or intensity of that stimulus, right? That, that's the general idea. Um, I think the main teaching point in this, though, is that the condition of the intermittent explosive disorder would be a diagnosis if and when the identified behavior, in this case, anger, is not elsewhere classified. So if somebody were to come in acutely manic and they turned over some tables, um, you probably would feel comfortable diagnosing mania or bipolar one disorder. And you might think to also diagnose the intermittent explosive disorder uh, up until uh, realizing that you wouldn't unless that same behavior was seen outside of the context of mania. So if we think that Jimmy may have a narcissistic personality disorder, in order to provide a secondary diagnosis, we would have to be reassured that his anger is not due to his narcissism. Uh, and that's a difficult part here, especially since he's only in a single episode. So good point. The answer is yes, we would consider it. And that consideration would need to take into account where we identify this behavior, the anger, and then if it is readily identified outside of the context of another mental disorder, in this case, narcissistic personality disorder. By the way, um, I mentioned this condition of the intermittent, the intermittent explosive disorder uh, itself. Uh, it had populated a chapter called the impulse control disorders. Uh, does anyone happen to know or have any guesses as to other examples of deficits in impulse control? So actual diagnoses? Isn't um, ADHD an impulsivity disorder? So so the answer is yes and no. Um, the, the, uh, the core feature of ADHD is definitely impulsivity, right? Hyperactive slash impulsive type versus the inattentive type. Uh, of course, there's a third type called combined. Uh, but um, the impulsivity there would be due to the ADHD. It would not be diagnosed outside of that as a separate disorder within the impulse control disorders. So uh, ADHD um, would be considered outside. Now, I will say that the DSM-5 has reorganized things, but um, I don't think this group really has to worry itself with regard to the current categorization. I just wanna make sure we introduce some disorders that are related to the intermittent explosive disorder. Borderline personality disorder has a component of impulsivity. Uh, impulsivity is actually a diagnostic criteria of the borderline personality disorder um, and the antisocial personality disorder for that matter. But in each case, they're considered to be personality disorders and would operate in the personality disorders chapter, not in the chapter previously known as the impulse control disorders. So yes, impulsivity, but in those cases, again, the point to be made is that the impulsivity is seen in the context of another mental disorder, in this case, and specifically the personality disorders. Another impulse control disorder uh, previously classified is called pyromania. Pyromania. 
Anybody know what pyromania is? Uh, setting fires. Yeah, right. It, 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 was this, it was described as the irresistible impulse. There's that word again, to set fires. Right. Individuals who are afflicted with pyromania will often report that they have this, this impulse, this thought that they are unable to control, that, that basically it comes on like a switch um, and they feel compelled and motivated to actually set fires. And once they do, uh, the rising anxiety caused by this impulse is uh, very, very rapidly um, uh, decreased. Two other major examples with regard to conditions previously classified as an impulse control disorder other than pyromania and intermittent explosive disorder. Kleptomania? Good, that's it, yeah, kleptomania. Really, same exact etiology, well, similar etiology to the uh, pyromaniac, uh, although stealing ste or stealing objects replaced for fire setting. And then one more. Trichotillomania. Okay, trichotillomania. In this case, um, hair pulling replaces either stealing objects or setting fires. Trichotillomania. Um, trichotillomania and a new condition called excoriation disorder, right, which is picking skin versus picking hair, have been removed from the previous chapter in the DSM-4 and a newly uh, created chapter in the DSM-5 referred to as the obsessive compulsive and related disorders. So both kleptomania and trichotillomania are considered to be on the spectrum now with obsessive compulsive disorder. Hence the title of the new chapter, Obsessive Compulsive and Related Disorders. All right. Any other thoughts about the character Jimmy or any other characters in the Jimmy you'd like to discuss this morning? Um, there was a moment when uh, George started adopting Jimmy's mannerisms. Um, yeah, towards the end. Anybody know the clinical term for that? If you're in the room with an individual and you actually see them begin to adopt your mannerisms. Is it called mirroring? Uh, that would be right. Um, there's another term for it that's published in the DSM called echoproxia. Echoproxia. If echoproxia is the mirroring of mannerisms, what then is echolalia? Mimicking another speech or repeating them, echoing. Both echoproxia and echolalia are diagnostic criteria for a condition called catatonia. Now, in this episode, I wanna make it very clear, George Costanza is not catatonic. Uh, my point is that George Costanza is actually demonstrating a feature that can be uh, uncovered in a patient assessment that is in part the finding of a condition called catatonia. So, uh, as is the clinical term or the clinical description of echolalia. Catatonia is a condition that could be a subtype of a, of a larger syndrome, such as schizophrenia, and catatonia could be a condition that stands by itself and now is defined and categorized in the chapter titled Schizophrenia and Other Psychotic Disorders. So in 2021, catatonia is considered to be a psychotic disorder. And it, it's considered to be a prime example of disorganized behavior. Specifically, the behavior of the individual demonstrates that they are not interacting with their environment. And examples of that misinteraction or non-interaction include both echoproxia and echolalia, as well as several other criteria for which I think the individual is required to have more than two from, from a list. 
there are two terms that come up that clinicians may demonstrate during a routine mental status exam that are also part of this definition that I just want to review, despite the fact that I really don't believe they are demonstrated in the episode to Jimmy. Uh, one is called a stereotypy, and the other is called a mannerism. Um, and the reason why is that these usually come up on exams, and as we talk, uh, I, would, I would not be surprised if there was a clinical vignette on the shelf final that the medical students are actually and currently sitting for today, for which the single best answer is either a mannerism or a stereotypy. A stereotypy is defined as a repetitive and non-goal-directed behavior. So a stereotypy example might be headbanging just a repetitive behavior that is not goal-directed. That differentiates from a mannerism <clears throat> that is a specific non-goal-directed activity or, or, or a repetition <clears throat> within an overall goal-directed activity. And one example I like to give from a situational comedy that has <clears throat> since been syndicated is uh, Robert Barone in Everybody Loves Raymond. Anybody here familiar with the sitcom? For those who are familiar, do you recall how Robert eats? What he does when he eats that used to annoy Raymond? No? When Robert eats, he actually and always touches the fork or spoon to his chin before he puts the food in his mouth. So eating and using the fork to, to eat would be the overall goal-directed activity. Nobody would have a problem with that. The mannerism would be the touching of the chin, right? The, the senseless act within, part, within an overall goal-directed activity called a mannerism. All right, so quick review of at least four symptoms of what defines catatonia. Again, a freestanding illness itself published in the schizophrenia and other related disorders chapter of the DSM, or it can actually be a subtype of a larger disorder. Examples there would be schizophrenia and major depressive disorder. Any other observations, any other behaviors you thought pertaining to George or any other characters in Sit, uh, the sitcom, the episode, the Jimmy. I just think, um, Elaine, when Jerry was talking about what happened at the doctor's office, at the dentist's office, she was kind of dismissive of what he was talking about, um, especially if he was sexually assaulted by the doctors. She was just like, oh, who cares? You're single anyway. I just thought that was super strange and super out there for her to say. Yeah, you know, um, comments like that, uh, number one, are, are fairly repetitive with regard to this character. And we always, we always have to be reminded that her and Jerry had a past life. Um, previous to uh, season one, um, Jerry and Elaine were an item. They were going out. And um, their relationship as friends was born out of a more intimate relationship. So you have to wonder, um, what actually is the ideology? of comments like that because they are not isolated in a vacuum. Uh, they occur quite frequently and occur frequently within the context of Jerry talking about intimate relationships. And that even includes this relationship that he has with his dentist, uh, which you know, using the word intimate is, is, is taken uh, in a twisted way here, but you could see Elaine's reaction. So what, what happens to Jerry? We haven't talked about him. Why is, he the, why, why is he in the dentist's office and what does the dentist use? Um, he's there for, I think, a cavity, but mm -hmm. the dentist uses nitrous oxide and like puts him basically not to sleep, but to sleep. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, you know, a couple of things with this. Um, this introduces the idea of an inhalant as a substance of abuse. And of course, nitrous oxide, which is a gas, has medicinal value. 
Uh, and there are different subtypes of inhalants that do in fact have medicinal value. Uh, on the other hand, all of these have vapors that result in either intended effects as drugs of abuse, or in the case of nit um, nitrous oxide, a drug of abuse, um, as well as um, unintended effects or adverse effects uh, of taking this drug recreationally. Um, from that perspective, we could look at nitrous oxide. Again, nitrous oxide is, is uh, there are four subclasses of inhalants. The intoxication of any is going to look very similar to the intoxication of alcohol. So if you were to take a test and the clinical vignette presented someone who appears drunk, alcohol intoxication and nitrous, or I should say inhalant intoxication, we'll use the general term, inhalant intoxication, would present similarly. There are a couple of differences that will help you tease, tease away nitrous oxide as the single best answer. Number one, during the acute intoxication, the individual may experience euphoria. And that is certainly an intended effect. That is why people will use inhalants. That is not the case for alcohol. Alcohol can be disinhibiting, but it will not result in euphoria. There's a difference. Matter of fact, alcohol is a CNS depressant and over time can induce depression, not euphoria. Number two, there are neurological sequelae of acute intoxication from inhalants, and that is absent from the individual who is intoxicated from alcohol. If alcohol induces neurologic sequelae, it's due to vitamin B deficiency caused by the alcohol decades later. And that's usually part of a syndrome called the Wernicke's Korsakoff syndrome. That is decades later, that is not while the individual is under the influence. And those I think are the two most common ways in clinical practice and therefore on exams, the clinician could differentiate inhale intoxication from alcohol. You wouldn't use this as a differentiating factor. I mean, you wouldn't sit around and wait and observe and then um, diagnose one over the other here, but you should know that alcohol in fact does have an identified withdrawal syndrome. Inhalants do not. There is no physiologic withdrawal phase when someone acutely stops or reduces the amount of inhalant they use. So there is a withdrawal, there, there is such thing as alcohol withdrawal. There is no such thing as a physiologic withdrawal phase for inhalants. All right, we got about five minutes left. Any final observations or questions you have? Anything pertaining to the Jimmy? Um, I also noticed that there was this one period of time when uh, uh, Jerry was saying that it's too embarrassing to go watch somebody sing. <laughs> and then it was too embarrassing to admit that um, a man is attractive and then also being embarrassed by certain magazines. Like I, there was just like a bunch of times when he was feeling very embarrassed. Yep, so in this case, let's equate embarrassment to anxiety, right? I mean, I, I think we could kind of um, interchange uh, one descriptor for the other and then ask ourselves the question, why does Jerry experience anxiety in these situations? And it allows us to quickly review very basic concepts pertaining to personality development and specifically the theory of Sigmund Freud. So uh, again, we all come into this world as an id. We all come into this world governed by the pleasure principle. At some point, Freud postulated around the age of two, the individual had the development or the start of the, of the development of a second part of their personality called the superego. The superego itself is guided by the reality principle 
and is really funneled through that two-year-old's interaction with their parents. So I think quickly, when we, when we hear Jerry say the things that he does in the Jimmy pertaining to what makes him uncomfortable or embarrassed or anxious, we could begin talking about his relationship with his parents, not only in the here and now, but also as a child, maybe as young as two years of age. Because at that point where the superego begins to develop, the individual will have constant conflict. They'll want to do something, but they'll also begin to learn that they have to do something else. And that mismatch, that conflict results in friction that Freud labeled anxiety. And if the individual's third personality component called the ego has strength to alleviate that anxiety, the individual will be symptom free. And if there is poor ego strength, the individual may actually experience anxiety. And in the most severe cases, may actually demonstrate clinically significant anxiety, which itself might be demonstrated in the character Jerry Seinfeld in the Jimmy. And we have no idea why these particular objects are causing the anxiety that they do. Uh, but um, once we establish that this is likely the result of a weak ego for the character Jerry Seinfeld, we can then begin to investigate uh, why these particular objects are making him anxious. And what is it that his superego is mandating being governed by that reality principle that his id actually wants expression? Why that conflict? And again, no, no easy answers uh, this morning, but that's the general approach that you would take with regard to uh, Jerry's feeling embarrassed, Jerry's feeling anxious. And we'll end it there. So we're right at the bottom of the hour. I want to thank everybody for jumping on today. And for those of you who will be with us at 1230 uh, over Periscope, we'll be discussing um, our movies. We're going to do both uh, The Incredibles and Misery, uh, as um, uh, both will actually be part of Night's Watch. So we'll catch everybody back then. Thanks. Thank you.